Excellent. I'm Brian Douglas. That is my government name, but most people know me on the internet as B Dougie. And I'm here to talk about visualizing data in React. So who's ready for this? Excellent. All right, so I usually start with a story every time I give a talk. I've done this uh, a few times. Anybody familiar with the University of Miami? Some people, anybody went to the U? Got one back there. <laughs> not, the, not the Ohio one. Uh, so this is um, Howard Schellenberger. So this is the first uh, football coach for Miami's football team. And uh, he joined in the 80s uh, to start the football program. At the time, the Univ University of Miami was specifically known for doctors. Like, if you want to do medical, uh, that's what Miami was known for. Uh, so to start a football program in Florida, which is where Miami's at, uh, you have to compete against Georgia and Alabama and all these sort of powerhouses of, of football. So he was, had a conundrum. So in order to recruit people for his football team, he went to the neighborhood surrounding the university. Uh, and what that turned into was five different championships uh, from 1983 to 2001. And the way it worked was folks who are basically a men's football team. So the brothers and the cousins of the folks who played previously also played for Miami. And he had this like constant cycle of new talent coming from the neighborhood and all celebrating the football team. Uh, so that's a little history lesson. I'll touch back on that a bit. But this is me on the internet. Uh, I am B. Dougie. Uh, that is a link that you can go to to find my, uh, my Twixer. What are we calling it now? X. Uh, you can find all that stuff there, oss.fy slash Dougie. Uh, I am the chief sauce officer. I did give myself that title uh, for the, the company I did create. And yeah, you could like, put anything on the, uh, the card. So play around with that. Uh, but I want to talk about open source real quick, because we're going to visualize data in React. But this was actually my first open source contribution ever, <laughs> was this email, which is uh, ironic. Um, but I actually was trying to solve a problem in Node.js, and I didn't know how to use GitHub at the time. I was like brand new to the industry as a developer, junior dev, and didn't know GitHub issues was a thing. So I went to the GitHub repo of the thing I was using to build, like to solve my problem, and just emailed the developer, like, hey, I'm stuck, could you help me? Uh, and to my surprise, they responded. So like, this is the actual screenshot uh, from my Gmail. Uh, and at the time, I didn't even know... <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know he was in Thailand the entire time I was going back and forth. So I was like, surprised that he was emailing me back like 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, I didn't know what a digital nomad was. I didn't know what GitHub issues were. And I also didn't know what K-pop was at that time. But I know what it is now. Like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really into BTS at this point. Actually, Blackpink is my, my go-to. All right, now we got some fans out here, all right. That's what's up, all right. So this whole context is about like building community open source, and that's why I start with the University of Miami and sort of recruiting with, around the neighborhood as well. And that's like, one of my passions is like, getting in the scene and talking to developers um, a lot. Um, this is a quote I live by, which is, if you don't got sauce, then you lost. And it's a, it's a Gucci Mane quote, and um, I love it so much that I actually named the company that I, I built a couple years ago, Open Sauce, because I thought it was funny and it kind of looks like open source. Uh, so we were first, those uh, YouTubers who have open source, they also have, a, they have more SEO than we do. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk about actually an, one of the earliest successes in open source. Uh, and this is actually at Pixar. So actually I met some Pixar designers last night at GitHub. I was hanging out there, uh, weird flex I know, but hanging out at GitHub at the design event. And um, not a lot of people know this story about the electric fence, which they had a bug, so Bruce, specifically as the engineer at Pixar in the 80s, had a bug that used to come up all the time in, in their software. And his idea was like, I, what if I could just like not have to rebuild, like refix this bug every single time? Um, so as the story goes, this is Bruce. Um, and in the 80s, most engineers looked like this with the mustache and everything. Actually, engineers look like this today, too. It's, it's really weird. Uh, so he finds the bug, and then he basically is like, OK, I've solved this bug. Let me save this bug to disk. Uh, so like, back in my day, we used these little floppy disk things, where actually weren't floppy at the time. Uh, and he thought, what if I get this package this and then reuse it next time I have to solve the bug again? Uh, so he packaged it up. Uh, they used this thing called email discussion forums, uh, because the internet was not a thing at that point. And he just shares it with the public. And the beauty of that is that Bruce can now share his work with others, but everyone gets a benefit from the benefit of free open source software. Um, so 
you think of these like forks, if you're gonna go fork a copy or get a copy, download a copy of that software, uh, that's how it works. Uh, and then what's cool about this is folks can also add to that software. So they can have their own version that they can contribute back to original, like Bruce's solution, uh, which is quite amazing. On, on top of that, you also get discovery. So not just Pixar benefits from, the, from this software. They also can use this in other places. Um, so having comments uh, on pull requests, yeah, using issues as well to have com commentary, uh, it actually helps not only open source maintainers, but the entire open source uh, community. So that context really just lives on GitHub today. Uh, so we don't use, well, some people use email still to uh, make contributions. Uh, but today, most folks will have their code open sourced on GitHub or closed source on GitHub as well. So everything I show today is going to be open source. I can't go through all the code. I only got 20 minutes today. Um, so just go to the repo and, and dig into the code and um, ask questions, open issues. So. I wanted to call out two things, uh, and these are like the two main things that are uh, on the GitHub repo. So like this is where all, instead of uh, email forms, you got a GitHub repository. The contributors tab, or the contributors square, and then also the insights tab. And I didn't mention this previously, but I actually used to work at GitHub, like almost five years. And something that used to come up all the time in conversation with users and open source maintainers was like, this could be better. And I said, yeah, say less. Uh, so I started working on this, and today, GitHub looks like this. So there's also a double entendre in the title, uh, visualizing data in React. I'm going to use React's repo specifically for the data. Um, so on the React repo, you have the Insights tab. It looks like this. And you have the Contributors tab. So just like zooming in and enhancing it there. Uh, but you could also see like these blobs and charts and graphs. And sometimes it's not as helpful. Uh, there are some like little tricks that not a lot of folks know about. Like you could actually zoom on specific uh, uh, months or quarters to see what contributions look like. But you still have like a mystery of like what, what am I looking at? Uh, so back in 2022, I used to talk to this company called DigitalOcean about this event every October called Hacktoberfest. And Hacktoberfest, specifically it's a one month hackathon for developers remotely to make contributions in open source. And one of the biggest pain points was spam. Like, how do you identify where contributions are coming from? Who are these folks doing this? Uh, we had the XE vulnerability early today with this whole social engineering attack. Uh, look it up if you haven't caught up on that. But to have some context on like, where contributions are going. And that's what we did for like, the very first iteration of this product was just put a bunch of faces on the screen. And that's a representation of all pull requests happening in those 30 days. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I didn't know if we could do it. We did end up doing it. And this is, uh, this is actually 500,000 PRs in the month of October. Um, we have this cool enhance button that I, I didn't animate for the slides, I actually took it out, but it actually expands to show all contributions and you can highlight and zoom and enhance there. But the evolution of that ended up turning into like, what if I could, okay, I'm not doing Hacktoberfest every October, but what if I have projects that I care about and want to have folks get insights on? So uh, there's actually another URL you can go to as well, oss.fy slash react, and you'll see all react projects, React meta projects, and frameworks to see their data. And you can sort of click in and then find out who's contributing in the last 30 days as well. Uh, we do have to go back to 90 days, and we have a little filter as well. But I bring this up because the real ultimate goal was like to see faces of pull requests happening on the page. But also, I wanted to be able to see what contributions folks are making. So these are actually folks uh, at Meta who are contributing specifically to the React project. Uh, and it gives me a list of their contributions, give me a context on what's happening. Uh, and the real goal is like I can now have an understanding like where this project is going. Uh, and this is something that we, we thought a lot about, and like this was where we landed, um, but definitely open to more feedback. But the goal is how to track contributions, how to track contributors. Uh, and I also mentioned that everything that we've built, uh, we use this library called Nevo. So if you're familiar with D3, it's how you visualize data. Um, Nevo is just a nice React layer on top of that. Uh, so you just have to provide your JSON and um, our structured data. Uh, and it does a lot of work for you. Well, you still have to design it as well, so not all the work. But maybe AI will fix that for us. I also wrote a whole blog post that goes way more details on how we went back to the nuance of, of building uh, that contributor distribution chart with just the faces. Uh, so I'd encourage you just to check out the, uh, the URL there if you want to read a blog post. Um, but one of the hardest things was actually getting Nevo to work the way I wanted and round, literally just round the images was kind of a, a bit of a, a struggle. Uh, so I thought I'd write a blog post about that specifically. 
Uh, something else I want to talk about uh, that we sort of progress into, okay, we can display contributions, but how can we sort of get a visualization of contributions happening at the time over a, a course of multiple repositories and projects? Uh, so we just built this uh, open source contributor tree map, and the idea is you can see a distribution of contributions over repositories that you can drill down to see contributors, uh, and it looks like that. Uh, and then it looks like this for the React team. So this was a couple months ago. This is all contributions happening on the React code base. Uh, and then the next step was, okay, how do you understand what you're looking at here? You can also click through, but then just give me the summary. Uh, so it breaks down not just code contributions, but also those comments uh, and the feedback that happens within discussion on PRs as well. So this is easy for React because React is a very active project. There's a lot of stuff happening. There's, uh, there's not a new release that's actually out coming up pretty soon. Um, everyone knows React, but how do you visualize what I'd call activity? And I had a conversation with the co-creator of Kubernetes, so it's a DevOps tool, uh, Brendan Burns. And early days at Google, Brendan and team, they, they decided that issues is a really good metric for interest, and then PRs are a really good metric for adoption. And when you start looking at anybody outside of Google or anybody outside of your, your team, that's how you see the adoption, and that's how you see the interest. And something that we did at, at GitHub when I worked there, like we identified top 100 projects not based on stars, and the first thing we looked at was unique issue authors. Because when we see how often people are engaging in the project, it's a really good place to start. So that's what we have with this engagement ratio as well. So measuring uh, comments and commits and really starting to understand, okay, is there something happening? Is there some traction? Should I use this library? Um, and what we did is we, we built this like little algorithm, which I math. Um, but this is basically the ratio for some popular projects. So Kubernetes obviously being highest because they've got some strong governance. Uh, but then you look at Tiger Beetle, which is pretty niche, uh, built-in Zig, uh, up-and-coming software. It's just, yeah, it's got a lower score. Not that it's bad, but it's just getting started. Uh, something else that I, I also, I got a C in statistics, so I went to the University of South Florida, go Bulls. Um, but I got a C in statistics. And, but I learned all about statistics last December when I was thinking through how, what other metrics can we put in this product. So rate of self-selection is the idea of like anybody outside your team, how often contributions come. So think of that one tool that you find that it's like in the entire tool chain. Who built this? Like what happened? So when you have like that, then you can look at things like TypeScript and, the, and Q4 had zero outside contribution outside of Microsoft. So like those are types of things you can think through. It's like, okay, well, like this whole framework, this language is now dictating the future of my career. Maybe there's like an opportunity to like add some influence, participate in that ecosystem. So moving along, highly like, Basically, we summarized those last two, uh, couple slides into visualizing engagement. And what we have, we call this the repo page. Uh, we didn't want to rebuild GitHub, but we wanted to add more context to what GitHub doesn't have already. Uh, so right off the bat, like we already have things that you don't get on GitHub, but we, we feel like it's an, it's an opportunity to tell like a broader story. Uh, so the story being lottery factor. So the chances of somebody winning the lottery, uh, probably not gonna come back and work on this code base. Uh, we want to identify if more than two people uh, hit the lottery factor, then that's going to be pretty high. Uh, and the other thing is confidence. Uh, and this is something actually near and dear to my heart because the opportunity of like, I just want to walk into the room and find out like, can I make a contribution? Can I? And this is not only just open source, it's also for internal private repos. And so anybody who engages through comments and forks and, and stars, what's the likelihood of them actually making contributions? And you can make that quick judgment of like, it's just like a walk score. Like I know. It's a walk score at 90, so I know I can go get my groceries without getting in the car. So confidence, the likelihood that the uh, star or that engagement will turn into a contribution. Uh, so all that context to eventually get to what we, we now call star search. So we actually spent um, a, actually a week in Miami uh, recently um, working on this problem. And this problem, star search. Actually, I realize there's no back button. But the context of star search is like in the 90s, I used to sit on my grandma's couch and watch a show called Star Search and discover Beyonce, Ryan Gosling, Justin Timberlake, who's very famous right now. And think about that for developers. Like, if I could discover up and coming developers on certain teams or on open source, like, think about how, how powerful that'd be. So, um, Adam, who I think I actually hear at this conference, so Adam, like, I'd love to hang out with you if you're, if you're here. Uh, but I saw this tweet, like, March 28th. Adam was like, hey, I need to hire a Tailwind developer who has an interest in Rust. And uh, the pipelines is not really there for Tailwind and Rust right now. Uh, so he's like, man, it would be great if I can like, respond. Tell me who, who I should be talking to. 
Uh, so I thought, hey, we've got all this data, we've been working on this for about a year, uh, what if we <laughs> added AI uh, to the stuff we already had and find tailwind developers that have Rust, or that know Rust? Uh, so this is this quickly, this is a screenshot of me, I would have showed you me typing it, but there's no keyboard here. Uh, so here's a screenshot of me typing tailwind developers that know Rust. And uh, if you're sitting in your seats, you could also do this well, I'll do it later. This, this cool talks as well. But you could also ask the same question, like who are the Tailwinds developers that also know Rust? And what we've done is we want the PR titles, descriptions, issues, discussions, releases, to eventually build a data set to, to have a good understanding of like, who are the experts within this technology. And we only, today we expose just avatars and GitHub handles uh, just for uh, privacy reasons. Uh, but the idea there is if someone's working on something like some of that code in public, there's a chance that you can join their issues and have like join the conversation there as well. Uh, and then part of our other product is we can also hover over, uh, if you have a, a profile in open source, you can hover over there, click through, and then look at their open source profile. Uh, so as I mentioned, it all works today. And um, this all story, like we, we started with the conversation about like University of Miami. Um, I've been doing React since like 2014. Uh, and I remember the first story of like, okay, Facebook stood up on stage at F8 and was like, hey, we have React. And I was I actually worked in Orlando, and F8 was in Orlando at the time in one of the Disney convention centers. Um, and one of the engineers was like, hey, Facebook launched a library. And uh, we all looked up and we just started laughing. Um, who would have thought, like, what, 10 to 12 years later, that now we have React is embedded in almost everything. And Tom was the person who announced it originally. And he goes through that story of like, the adoption, like it just wasn't there. And um, the difference between that and JS Coffee EU uh, was the University of Miami story. Uh, Tom actually went and found, in these two videos, the React documentary and this like, fireside chat with Tom, uh, he went and found like, core team members, like, creators of Redux and Webpack and, and Babel, and invited them all to come work at Facebook. Uh, like literally come move to the Bay Area and work on this one problem. And I think that was actually the difference for React in particular, because there's a lot of solutions at that time. There were a lot of better solutions, to be quite frank. Uh, but that story is like, it's an age-old story, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to discover next great developers uh, through just using data. So I, I round this out with um, visualizing commits ensure nothing is lost. And so like, if you look at commits, you look at comments, there's a story to be told within that data. So I'll leave you with this. If you don't got sauce, then you lost. And um, uh, also let you know, remind you that there's a link that you can find me if you want to hang out. I'll be walking around in a pizza hat and uh, probably this shacket. All right, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.